Good evening. Thanks for coming and for inviting us, hosting the program. My name is Twig Holland. I'm with Aquarium Water Company. And what we're going to do tonight is talk about the drought, the severe drought that we experienced in 2016, some of the uh, uh, steps that Aquarion took to get water to folks, and then we're going to talk about some conservation measures that folks can do at home. A bit about Aquarion, we are the largest investor-owned water utility in New England, and we're one of the largest in the United States. The company was founded in 1857, and one of our founders and our second president was P.T. Barnum. Uh, we have grown since then. We supply over half a million people. We're in 21 or 51 towns in Connecticut, and we've got a sprinkling of communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire that we serve as well. We are in the process of being acquired by Eversource, another utility, and if all goes well through the uh, uh, review process, we expect that that um, endeavor will be complete at the beginning of 2018. Here's where the water comes from for the folks in Simsbury. There are a total of eight wells. It's, uh, it's a little tough to see on this map. It's a little busy, but the blue dots are wells. There's three couple here. There's um, a few there, a couple three there. And we serve over 14,000 people in this area, in Simsbury and Grand Granby and East Granby, and we supply over 2 million gallons of water per day. What we're going to do is talk about the drought, and to do that, I need to show you something about the area that had the most severe drought, which is the four communities of Darien, Stamford, New Canaan and Greenwich, and, I'll sh and that will set the basis for the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit between the Stanford system and the Bridgeport system. You'll see the connection when, as I roll through the presentation. Laurel Reservoir is in Stanford. This is how the reservoir looked before the drought began in 2016, and this is what it looked like in autumn. And if you'll notice, when I go backwards, see these little uh, shrubberies here? And now they've got their own little island. So it was a very, very severe drought. And what sets up a severe drought is a prolonged lack of normal rainfall or precipitation over an extended period of time. So if it rained the same place, the same amount, the same uh, time, day in and day out, our precipitation graph would look like this flat black line. But as you can see, I've got here 116 years of precipitation data, and the rainfall goes higher one year, lower another, higher one year, lower another. But for the most part, if the precipitation stays within an acceptable range, we don't worry so much. It rains a little bit more one year and a little bit less another year, and for the most part, we're in pretty good shape. But what happened in 2013, it stopped raining. It rained less than normal. In 2014, it rained a lot less than normal. Here's 2015, and in 2016, we found ourselves in one of the worst droughts in 116 years and the fifth worst since the mid-1960s. So it was a very, very severe drought that we experienced last year. Where we are now, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had below average rainfall. And according to the government's drought map, we have a below average precipitation right now. This is as of um, last week. So you can see how we can get, um, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, how we can go from having a lot of water to a week or two without water and conditions can um, quickly become dry. We know that a lot of water that's used in warm weather ends up on the lawn. 
and we know how outdoor water is used by looking at these baselines, this trough here in consumption. Here is January to April of 2015. Here's December to April 2016. And what that does is that's pretty much indoor water use only. So it sets a baseline and what we're looking at, again, it's the four towns of Stamford, Darien, New Canaan, and Greenwich. And then look at what happens in the summertime. Here's winter, here comes spring and summer and, and early autumn again. And so now we know that people are using a lot of water outdoors. The average is 88 gallons per person per day. Most people are very water efficient, but we have some users who use a lot of water. And we know by looking at graphs like this that outdoor water use is a huge potential for a lot of savings. Here's another graph. The national average happens to be Easton right at 88 gallons per person per day. Here's Simsbury at 75. So you're in Simsbury, the consumption is a little below the average, but here's what we look at. You use about 145 gallons a day, but in the summertime, in the wet months, a third of that is being used outdoors. So have you ever been driven through Iowa? I keep, go I keep driving across Iowa for some reason, and from corner to corner, that state is nothing but cornfields. It seems that Iowa grows a lot of the corn that's consumed by humans, used in corn fructose products and so forth, and in animal feed. And here we have a pretty nice lawn. There are three times more acres of lawns than irrigated corn. So if you look at, here's little Connecticut with all that green, and here's all of Iowa, and you can start to see that lawns are considered the single largest irrigated crop in America. So we're putting a lot of water on lawns. So let's look at what happened last year. The Stanford system in the middle of July was struggling. Let me take a moment to explain this graph. This top line, the green line, is a 20-year trend of how the reservoir system usually behaves. And if you look, here's January, it fills, it fills, it fills, it fills. And then when the hot summer months come along, and the sprinklers turn on and the pools get filled, you can see that the reservoirs deplete, they level off, and then they start to fill again when we have more precipitation in the winter months and in the spring months. What happened in 2016 was that the reservoir struggled to fill, but it got pretty much up to where it usually is, but then it didn't rain, and when it doesn't rain, the sprinklers come on, and what happened was we were using water much more quickly than usual. And so we, came, we became very concerned about this delta here between the normal behavior and what we were actually seeing. And so in mid-July, we sent out a bulletin to our customers in the, those four towns, Greenwich, Stamford, Darien, and New Canaan, and we said, please, where the, the reservoirs are struggling, we haven't had a lot of rain, we really need for everyone to conserve water. And consumption went down briefly and then it shot back up. And so now we got to the middle of August, the reservoir is at 64% full, and this time we were more specific and said, you know what, water your grass twice a week, your grass will be fine, but we really have a situation here and we need everyone to conserve. And consumption went down a little bit, but again, it went back up. And what we did 
for the next six weeks was we worked with the local officials in those four towns. We worked with the agencies that regulate Aquarion, which are Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Public Utility Regulatory Authority, and the Department of Public Health. And we worked with those agencies to declare a drought emergency. And on, in mid-September, we said no more use of outdoor water because we were very, very concerned of having adequate water for the people and for fire protection. And as you can see, we were very, very close to that first drought trigger of a drought advisory. And the reservoir at that point was a little bit less than 53% full. So we considered it to be a very serious situation. The CEOs and the state agencies agreed with us that it was. Where the reservoirs actually ended up, Stanford got down as low as 110 days supply. Greenwich actually skimmed 50 days supplies in their system. And now we started moving water around. And one of the first things we did was we built a temporary above ground pipeline. If anybody had ever been along, driven along the Merritt in that part of the state, you would have seen this for part of your drive. It went under driveways, over stone walls, through backyards. And what this did was it was a shot of intravenous right in, of water right into the Stanford system. It came out of the Bridgeport system and it delivered four million gallons a day of treated water to the Stanford system and from then it moved on to Greenwich. Where we ended up in 2016 isn't a great story. Um, we, even with the um, ban on the use of outdoor water, the sprinklers got shut off, the car washes stopped, the plant nurseries couldn't, couldn't water, and even with those restrictions, we crossed the first drought trigger and we skimmed the next drought trigger, the drought watch. And eventually, the reservoirs began to um, fill. We now have twice weekly watering restrictions in those four communities. They can water on uh, particular days, depending on the last digit of their address. There is a system everybody knows about it. We've done a lot of advertising and direct mail. We've done used social media, ads at the train station. We had a movable billboard that we circulated around town to make sure that folks knew that um, we did have irrigation restrictions going on and so that people knew when they could and could not water. The good news was that we were confident enough that the reservoirs were going to perform okay, that we were able to ease the total restriction that we had from 2016 and allow some irrigation to occur. So what we'd like folks to do now in all corners of Aquarion's uh, supply system is to help us defeat the drought. And a lot of that involves reducing outdoor watering. We've worked with the University of Connecticut um, to look at watering. We've worked with the city of Dallas, which um, has a lot of experience with dealing with droughts because they're in a very, very dry climate. And what we have learned is that the more you water your grass, the more you need to water your grass. The roots stay very shallow and close to the surface. If you water less frequently and more deeply, they build a stronger network that's deeper. And if you water deeply and infrequently, that's where you get really robust roots. So your grass will survive with twice a week watering. Time of day is also important. When you water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on a hot summer day, a lot of, with overhead spray irrigation, a lot of the water evaporates before it hits the ground. So what we want folks to do is wait until after dinner, water through the night, water early in the morning to be the most beneficial. And then consider skipping the lawn fertilizer. What we've learned is that a lot of it contains salt. And the more salt you put on lawns, the more parched um, they can become and need more 
um, water. And then consider planting an edible landscape. I've got a couple of blueberry bushes and I've not had a berry ever um, because I'm feeding deer and I'm feeding birds. And if you do that, you have a lot of greenery and it doesn't require a lot of irrigation. And then use free water. Aquarion has um, partnered with a company that sells rain barrels. We simply are the facilitator. We don't make any money. Um, the, the, we uh, coordinate a supply center, a distribution center where folks can um, go to our website, order the rain barrels, and then we've got a place where, you, a convenient place where people can pick them up. And that'll provide irrigation. It stores rainwater and you can water at, at uh, your leisure. Conserving indoors, we really encourage folks to get low flush toilets, water efficient shower heads, put aerators on your bathroom and your uh, kitchen sinks. Um, and at your next opportunity, when you need to replace a washing machine or a dishwasher, we encourage folks to get Energy Star appliances. They not only are more water efficient, but they also use less electricity. You can reduce your use in a dishwasher from 15 to 6 gallons of water every time you run it. And a washing machine is even more dramatic. It reduces from 50 gallons per load to about 17. So they really are big water savers. And then do something as simple as turn off the tap. I do a lot of presentations uh, to middle school students. and. I always acknowledge they may not be able to influence their toilets or their shower heads, but they all manage their own toothbrushing habits. And the first thing we encourage them to do is shut the water off. The average bathroom sink puts out two gallons of water per minute. And if you brush your teeth for two minutes, you've now used four gallons of water. If you shut the tap off, you reduce that to one quart. So it's a tremendous savings and it doubles if you're brushing your teeth twice a day. And then quit jiggling. Jiggling the handle on the toilet to get it stopped running probably indicates that it needs a new uh, flapper valve. If you put a drop of blue food coloring in your tank, if you see it in the bowl a few minutes later, you may need to replace your valve. And then something is simple. Instead of letting the water run, keep a pitcher of water in the refrigerator. Cooking up savings, we're to, um, we understand that if you um, use the water from pasta, from vegetables, not only is it reclaiming water, but you're watering your plants with a lot of nutrients. Where we are so far this year, Again, in the Stanford system, the reservoirs behave more normally. Um, as you can see, they're um, a, a little bit lower than what we would expect at this time of year, probably owing to um, sparse precipitation in the last couple of weeks. But we really did have much more of a normal summer than we did last year. And we think that in part is in use uh, in part because of increased precipitation that we had in the winter and the spring months, but also we think that the drought restrictions and the irrigation uh, practices are helping. Going forward, we did take that temporary pipeline out. It's no longer alongside the Merritt. We continue to monitor the reservoirs and we're looking at some long-term capital projects. And we continue to communicate, to um, use a lot of different um, media to make sure that folks know that A, we want you to conserve water, and also for the folks in the four towns that were most affected um, so that they know that we still have irrigation restrictions and they are permanent, they're not temporary, they're permanent restrictions that they have. Our message is please, change some old habits, acquire some new ones, less water on the lawn, and we want you to do that because it's the right thing to do. I've listed a lot of links. If you go to Aquarion.com, you'll um, be treated to a number of um, informative links on our website. There's one for the Yukon study 
on there. You can also calculate your water consumption um, based on how you typically use water. So we invite you to go there um, to, to take a look around. And thank you for everything that our customers do to save water and conserve water. And we're grateful that you're doing that. We want you to continue doing that. So with that, are there any questions for me? There's a water company uh, down in Stanford, that, that area. Have they built any of the reservoirs in the last 40 years? So? Did they collect more water than they used to? No. Have they built any new reservoirs in the last 40 years? The population's bought up quite a bit now. It has. And there are a couple of things um, to, to think about with Stanford because the population may have increased. There are, um, there's been a lot of development going on. Something to keep in mind is that the new building codes require more energy saving uh, and water efficient appliances and fixtures. So any new houses, offices, condominium buildings that are being built are automatically built with those water saving enhancements included. Um, and we are um, notified when there's a particularly large um, complex being um, planned or a new office being planned, something like that, Aquarion is notified by the city and we have an opportunity to review the plans to make sure that we can supply those residents or those uh, building occupants. There is nowhere to put a new reservoir um, in any of our service areas and so that's really why we want folks to conserve. It's much the same as the power companies. There's nowhere to put a new generating plant and so the power companies are urging conservation and we are as well. Um, you dig wells down there? Like up, up this area, there's a lot of wells. You have eight wells, and they're all in, they're all in good shape. How I many can you have wells down there? We do have a couple. We do have some wells in that area, but most of the water supplied is surface water that comes in uh, to the reservoirs through the watershed. Streams, um, you know, just the natural terrain of the earth. Uh, not as much as groundwater. There's more groundwater in well and wells here in Simsbury. Any other questions? I'd like to introduce Laura Hart from the Farmington River, River Watershed. Watershed Association. I knew there were a lot of words. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your excellent presentation as well. Very much appreciate it. Uh, my name is Laura Hart, and I work for the Farmington River Watershed Association. Um, I have been involved in a lot of water quality issues over the years, and I actually grew up along the Farmington River as a child. It had a large impact on me. And I've had some conversations with my father, who also grew up along the Farmington River. And he remembers walking to school by the Farmington River and literally seeing the river run different colors. He would see it run red, run green, and this is from pollutants being dumped into the river directly from industries that were along the river. The Farmington River Watershed Association was established in the early 50s to address these concerns of the time. And this was created by citizens, it's a nonprofit organization. We're still working on water quality issues. We've come, thankfully, a very long way from the, the 50s and seeing that water pollution. But what they were dealing with at the time was what we call source pollution. So it was coming from specific places that we knew of and they got addressed. Today, um, the water quality is vastly better. It's a beautiful river, it's quite a long river, the Farmington River. A uh, portion of it is actually designated wild and scenic, 14 miles of it, so it has federal protection. People kayak in it, they swim in it. Um, we use it for many, many purposes and the watershed itself provides water for a very large amount of people. It provides water to Hartford and many other cities as well. But we are still facing some water quality issues. It's not source pollution. It's something that's a lot harder to pinpoint. 
a lot harder to address in some ways because you can't just go into the certain places that are polluting and change what they're doing. And it's called non-point source pollution. This is actually the number one water, water quality issue that we're facing, according to the US EPA, um, within the United States and also right here. And what that means is we are all a part of it. Every one of us can have an impact, negative or positive or combination thereof, that affects this river. And I want to start off talking a little bit about why are we talking about water? Well, water, as we all know, is extremely important. This quote kind of sums it up very nicely. There are three undisputed truths about water. Water is the basis of life. The amount of water is finite. And water has no substitute. It's not like oil, where we have alternative energies that we can turn to. Water means everything to us. So that brings me to River Smart. This year, um, the watershed has been involved and was given a grant uh, to work on River Smart with the goal of reducing polluted runoff, addressing that number one concern. And River Smart is funded in part by the Long Island Sound Futures Fund, which is administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Fund. So you just heard me say Long Island Sound. How are we connected? Here we are. In Simsbury, we're talking about the Farmington River, the Farmington River watershed. How do we connect our local environment with Long Island Sound, and why is this important? Well, everything that we do in this area, where we are here, not only affects our immediate environment, but it also affects a much broader scale one. And part of the mission of this project of River Smart is to educate people to understand how their impacts can affect their local environment and a much broader one. And that's where Long Island Sound comes into play. So what happens when it rains or when you water your lawn or um, anything like that, the schools watering their lawns, um, towns, businesses, all that, is a lot of that rainwater and other water that's put onto the surface does soak into the ground but a lot of it also runs off. And everything that runs off of your lawns ends up in the storm drains. Some people, if you look at a storm drain, may think that they're connected to the sewer system. The sewer treatment plants process all that and take care of it. This is not the case with runoff. Storm drains actually lead to the next body of water. There's no protection in there, and it goes straight into our streams potentially into the Farmington River. Now the Farmington River leads right to the Connecticut River, which takes it to Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound is important to us for many different reasons, not just for perhaps going to the beach and enjoying it. It's a uh, fishing industry that is involved in that, and also the ecosystem itself. It supports a lot of aquatic life and the life that depends on the aquatic life that lives there as well. Long Island Sound has four major rivers that pour into it, one of it being the Connecticut River. And that provides a lot of the fresh water that is needed in that environment. Because as a sound, it's not just, it's a little bit different than the ocean, open ocean, as it has a mixture of fresh water and salt water. And it's a home for a lot of species of animals that need those conditions. Um, also the home of where a lot of these species grow up before they go into the open ocean. So if all goes well, everything down there is quite happy and healthy. But what happens when we have a lot of rain, as opposed to a drought, um, if you look in this picture here, you see there's cars, there's a lot of hard surfaces, there's lawns, there's plants. All of that is affecting the water that's going down the drain. When we have very severe rainstorms, that can carry a lot of stuff very quickly and can lead to this. This is a picture of Long Island Sound from Hurricane Irene. And as you see, a lot of stuff was carried down the Connecticut River. And among the things that got carried down, which we're quite concerned with, is nitrogen and phosphorus. Those two things are good nutrients when they're on your lawn, in your gardens, things like that. 
and they're actually important for Long Island Sound as well. The issue becomes when there is an excess of these nutrients. When they enter the salt water down in Long Island Sound, all that amount of nutrients causes the algae to rapidly expand, which is called algae blooms, perhaps you've heard of it before. And with all that growth comes a lot of death as well. And as the algae decomposes, the process of the decomposition, the bacteria, they sink to the ground, the bacteria that decompose them deplete the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen that's in those waters. Everything needs oxygen. So all the things that are living in Long Island Sound, this is what ends up happening to them. This is devastating not only to beachgoers, but also to the fishing industry and the whole ecosystem. Um, all these species benefit from a healthy ecosystem. So any chance we get to remove the nutrients or prevent them from entering in the first place is very important. So again, the number one water quality problem is all that nitrogen, phosphorus, and other pollutants that are being carried by our waterways into Long Island Sound. So the, what can we do about it? The first part of it is actually just understanding the connections, knowing that the water that is on the land is affecting the water. Knowing that connection and understanding when we're talking about a watershed, it is a lot more than just talking about the water there. It's talking about the land. They're interrelated, very much connected, and you can't really just look at one or the other. Land use greatly impacts water quality. If you think about our reservoirs, they're surrounded by trees. So when it rains, the water soaks into the ground, naturally fills the groundwater, or some of it runs off into the reservoir. That's healthy, clean water for the most part. Now, as you move along to agricultural land, a lot of it is still it's natural land, so a lot of it is soaking down, but some of it is carried runoff and there's a lot of nutrients there. Move into suburbia, where we are now, you start to see a lot of hard surfaces. Any hard surfaces like the roofs, the sidewalks, pavement, all of that, the water's just running down the street. There are some things you can do. I don't know if you've been to Fitzgerald across the road, but they actually have a pervious pavement on their parking lot. So there's cars, oil, all that sitting there, but when it rains, that's soaking to the ground and being naturally filtered, as opposed to running into the river, which is a couple hundred yards away. Once you move into more urban areas, there's even more hard surfaces, so it becomes a tougher challenge to deal with. But as we change from a more natural landscape to one that has a lot more hard surfaces, the water problems um, become more prevalent. So as you see from the woods and meadows, all that natural land is allowing that water to soak into the ground, naturally replenish the groundwater. Agriculture, you tend to have a little bit more runoff because there's more hard surfaces, um, like packed dirt and so on between the rows, but it's not as huge of a problem. Once you get into residential and urban, that becomes a larger factor, is more of its runoff. There's a bunch of things you can do to change that. Um, so in kind of a residential area, you we will go over pretty quickly um, a bunch of ways in which to kind of reduce that or to, um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So in ways in which to redirect the water that's coming down to allow it to soak into the natural ground. In urban areas, much bigger issue but there are things like green roofs that are, are being um, brought into play, more green spaces, and again, directing that water. 
So, are you river smart? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, what does it actually mean to be river smart? And the first part is knowledge. We've been going around talking to a bunch of school groups, a bunch of adults, doing a lot of different projects in which we can communicate with the public so that they're aware of the watershed, our waterways, and how they might have an impact. And also understanding the link between land and water. Personally, when I change my car oil or mow the lawn, I'm not thinking about Long Island Sound or how that impacts it, and most people don't. But if you start with a little bit of knowledge, you can kind of change some of your behaviors for the betterment. So simple steps that you can do, we're gonna talk a little bit about lawn care, a little bit about landscaping your home, um, chemical safety, and water conservation. So first of all, when you're fertilizing your lawn, think about you're actually fertilizing Long Island Sound. When you're washing your car in the street, you're actually washing your car right on the water. And when your dog is going to the bathroom, again, right in the water. So let's talk about some river smart actions. Fertilize wisely. So first of all, a great thing to do is soil test your lawn. Yukon actually provides excellent service there. It's like $12 per sample or something like that. You send it to them, they analyze it, they send you back the results, and they also give suggestions of what you might need. Generally in Connecticut, it's pretty acidic here, so oftentimes the solution is lime, but there's different types of lime you can apply and so on. So that gives you a good starting point as opposed to being like, I want a beautiful lawn, let's just dump a bunch of fertilizers on here and hope for the best. That's not only costly, but again, can bring all those um, harmful nutrients into the water. If you do want to use fertilizer, please use organic, slow-release fertilizer. Avoid pesticides. That's not only harmful, can be harmful to you or pets, or wildlife, but again, the water. And also check the rain forecast. You don't want to apply it the day before you get a bunch of rain because that's just going to wash it away. Again, wasting money. And different ways you can mow the grass higher. You can leave the clippings. They're going to naturally fertilize the lawn as well. So being smart about it and kind of maybe changing how you do some things at home can have a big impact. Landscaping. Try to limit your lawn areas. Um, plant trees and native plants. Their root structure is designed so they're able to absorb more water. Um, also, native plants have been adapted to live in the conditions of the local environment. So generally, they're going to be better off in, in less water conditions and all that. Allow buffers to grow naturally or plant them if you're living very close to a wetland or a stream or a river, because that again will slow down that process of runoff. And think about those hard surfaces. If you have sidewalks, think about making them porous sidewalks. Um, if you have any hard surfaces, think about diverting that water whenever possible. And rain gardens, excellent way um, to kind of change your landscape for the betterment, and in my mind, very beautiful as well. This is one of the projects we've been working with this year. Uh, at the Keeney Park Sustainability Group in Hartford. They had a building that um, the water was just running off on the grass, briefly running down the street. So they wanted to make a change. So we went in with some planning and got together a group to actually implement the plans to design it so that there's areas within their lawn that they can divert the water to, to let it soak into the ground um, as you can see here, the downspouts lead straight to there and it's preventing, it's a little bit lower than the lawn area so that that rain is soaking in, not just from the rooftop, but also naturally. And they've designed it in a way where they don't really have to water it. So they're using that rainwater. Again, you can collect the rainwater too. Uh, also, this gives opportunity to nurture native plants, which is great for the local environment, great for our pollinators, and I personally think quite nice to look at. Another thing is conserve water. 
If you are watering your lawns and gardens, please check the rain forecast before you do that. Use a rain gauge so you can determine how much rain's coming down anyway. And try to water infrequently. As mentioned before, if you have a lawn that you're watering all the time, it becomes used to it, so it doesn't develop those deep roots. If you water less, over time you're gonna have a better, well-established lawn. And again, catching the rain, any chance that you get, you're not wasting energy by turning on the faucet. You're not wasting clean water that's really meant for drinking water. And direct your downspouts any chance you get into your gardens, your lawn, all of that. When you wash your car, try to use biodegradable soap and try to do it in an area where it can soak into the ground or better yet, take it to a car wash. They actually use a lot less water. They're much more efficient than you would at home. And they recycle the water. It goes into holding tanks below, they filter it out, and they use it again. And that water never directly enters the river. It goes to sewage treatment plants, the stuff that they cannot recycle. If you do own se septic, please maintain it. Again, conserving water is going to help um, because you're putting less stress on your septic system. Inspect it, have it pumped out, all of that is going to help in preventing pathogens and other nutrients from entering our groundwater as well as our waterways. Hazardous waste, if at all possible, please don't use it in the first place, that's the best method. Um, but if you do need to use it, please don't pour it down the drain. There's a lot of collection facilities. Most towns do it several times a year where you can bring that stuff and they'll properly dispose of it. At home, what you can do, compost and recycle. Properly dispose of pet waste. Pet waste has bacteria in it. If that comes into the water, it's gonna be a harmful bacteria in the water. Um, so you wanna throw that in the trash or down into the septic system. Uh, use non-toxic cleaners and green building materials whenever possible and fix leaks. Use water efficient fixtures and appliances and think about your water use inside of the home as well. And finally, please be River Smart. Please join me in taking the River Smart pledge. Not only does it show that it's a whole community that is working together to help prevent these pollutants from entering our waterways, but it also has a lot of knowledge on there and things you might not think of at first that can actually make a difference that are very simple to do. Please tell your family, your friends, your neighbors um, to carry this message. And the link is on riversmartct.org. Uh, there's a lot of resources. Just like to say that uh, we're doing an organic lawn care workshop here at the library on Monday, October 16th at 6.30. And we'll also be talking a lot about rain gardens as well, so you get very kind of hands-on uh, feedback. The River Smart website has a bunch of other resources on it, as does ours. If you own property that abuts water, a um, stream, the river, a wetland, we are offering My Healthy Stream Handbooks, which is a publication by Trout Unlimited, for free. It's an excellent resource to use, a lot of good information in there. And thank you for listening. Very much appreciate it. Um, please reach out to us, contact us. We're just right down the road in Simsbury. Um, and my information is up there. And please follow us and please be a River Smart Pledger. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.